Up, welcome back to ooh, new semester. Uh, welcome to SMU. I want to make a clear and definitive statement before we begin. For the record, our lawyers have checked, and there are, to our knowledge, no classified documents in our office. <laughs> so, <laughs> formerly classified, sure. Why not? But uh, nonetheless, uh, we're feeling pretty good about that. So thank you all for coming and coming to another semester where we're looking forward to uh, a lot of exciting things this semester. Of course, we have our big event, which I would like to you all to circle on your calendars on March, where's Rana? <laughs> 9th, 7th, 7th, March 7th. Uh, we have our 10th anniversary celebration. Uh, which is hard to fathom that we've been here 10 years uh, and we've decided to go, you know, for 11. We'll see what happens. Uh, and we're going to be celebrating with Peter Baker and Susan Glasser of uh, the Washington, uh, New York Times and of the New Yorker respectively, whose latest book on President Trump the Divider is um, divisive. Uh, and causing some wonderful conversations in Washington. But they're not gonna be talking just about Trump, they're gonna be talking about what it's like to cover the presidency from inside. Uh, and Peter has all kinds of great pictures that he sent me every now and then of you know different presidents yelling at him. Uh, which is pretty neat, if you ask me. So uh, that'll be on the, on the 7th, so please mark your calendar for that. Um, of course, we are still doing our uh, tours of Europe and of other battleground sites. Unfortunately, Europe is always a battleground site, as we'll be discussing tonight. Um, we're going to World War I this spring, but next year, uh, if you have not gone with us on our World War II trip, uh, or excuse me, our D-Day trip, in particular, um, please consider that for next summer. It occurred to me that um, we've actually not done D-Day since before pandemic. And here's a moment where you realize, oh my goodness, time has passed. That means there's been an entire four year class of SMU students that has gone through who has never had the experience of uh, seeing D-Day up close and personal. And it's really a very moving experience for people. Now, I see a few disappointed looks in the crowd from people who have done other trips with us, including D-Day, that we're going back. Don't worry, we've got other things planned too. But that's one to, to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, we're going to be thrilled at the end of the semester to bring back one of our postdocs for their victory tour, if you will. Uh, we always love to have our postdocs. I always tell you it's the most important thing we do and they're the cream of the program. And when they get their books published, we love to have them come back and show off. So we're gonna have Greg Brew talking about actually two books that he's got coming out on the same month, which is not easy, uh, and both about Iran and both about oil. So if you happen to have a car or are worried about the world blowing up, he'd be a good person to listen to. Speaking of the world blowing up, Susie Colbert. Uh, I am really thrilled that Susie's here. Thank you for coming. Susie, to my mind, is one of the, the great historians of NATO uh, that in the next generation, I can say next generation. I've known you for a while. Uh, next generation, she was trained at the University of Toronto, so she'll probably be very polite. And she is currently uh, working with the Grand Strategy Program at Duke University, one of the real great centers in the country for the study of Grand Strategy. We have a Grand Strategy course here at SMU. Uh, they have a whole program. So that gives you a sense of their emphasis and where we'd like to, to go, perhaps in year 11 or 12. But Susie makes that program run, and she's also written extensively as as I mentioned on NATO. And of course, what's interesting about NATO, and we've just been discussing this in my office a few moments ago, is that, you know, dissertations, as you know, take seven, eight, nine years to go from idea to actual publication, sometimes even longer. Uh, NATO has been in the news lately. And so uh, I, I'm looking forward to Susie not only telling us about this story, but also perhaps in the Q&A telling us about sort of the, the ups and downs of NATO enthusiasm uh, among the academic world as you've written this book. But I am thrilled beyond words to have Susie here, so please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming her. It's uh, great to be kicking off the new year with you here in Dallas. And I want to, before I get started, say thank you to everyone at the Center for Presidential History 
for the invitation to be here, uh, and the wonderful staff at the center, Jeff, uh, Brian Franklin, and Rana Spitz in particular, uh, for organizing uh, this occasion. And thank you all for uh, joining us. I know you could do many other things on what is an incredibly beautiful Dallas day. I'm uh, grateful for this Texas weather. It's not quite this nice in North Carolina. So I'm going to talk this evening about uh, my recent book, uh, Euro Missiles, the Nuclear Weapons that Nearly Destroyed NATO, which came out with Cornell University Press in November. So to give you a little sense of what the book is about, it's a transatlantic history of the so-called Euro Missiles. And by that, I mean the theater nuclear forces, TNF, or intermediate range nuclear forces, INF, that dominated much of the 1970s and 1980s. It's hard for a historian of NATO, but I am really going to try to keep the acronyms to a minimum, I promise. I only give them to you in case you know them by that name, because some NATO people just can't resist truncating everything. It's what comes with studying NATO. So it's a story that revolves around, in some ways, an unusual cast of characters for a history book. Its main protagonists are inanimate, in some ways. Three types of medium-range missiles. On one side, you have the Soviet Union's RSD-10 Pioneer, a weapon that was more often known and might be familiar to some of you in the audience by its NATO reporting name, the SS-20 Sabre. On the other hand, you have two US systems that round out this trio. The US BGM-109G Griffin ground-launched cruise missile, almost always just referred to as a Glickum, and the US Pershing II ballistic missiles. So the history that I tell in the book is one that started from a pretty basic premise, answering a seemingly straightforward question. Why did these three missile systems matter so much? Why were they so influential in shaping the Cold War politics of the 1970s and 1980s? So with my time today, I want to first pull back the curtain a little bit on what exactly a historian does in those seven, eight, or nine years it takes us to go from idea to book. And then I want to walk through some of the major episodes that I discuss in the book, though not all of them. I don't want to spoil it for those of you who might actually wish to read it. And then flag some of the key takeaways and arguments, all with a healthy dose of presidential history, I promise. So I think that we are really at an inflection point in many respects in thinking about the Cold War, but particularly the end of the Cold War. And that's a shift that I see being made possible by two major phenomena. One is the growing access to archival material, to documents from the 1970s, but particularly from the 1980s. The other is a generational shift. Sufficient time has passed that a generation of scholars thinking about these questions in this period do not have firsthand memories of the Cold War, even of a moment like this one. Many of us were only young kids, or maybe not even born, when the Berlin Wall came down. And so a critical element of this project for me was to revisit an episode that dominated the headlines in the 1970s and 1980s, but is mostly receded from popular memory and to write an accessible account of an immensely complex issue using these recently released and newly available archival materials. So in other words, I wanted to write a book that could help explain the stakes of the Euro missiles, primarily to a generation of readers who might not be immediately familiar with the dynamics at play, particularly the assumptions that underpin the Cold War, what the Cold War was really all about, why the Cold War was even waged, and why that competition involved so many nuclear weapons. So a few words about how I approached that task. I think typically when we think of the story of the Euro missiles, we tend to think of a moment like this one, of Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev side by side in Washington DC signing the INF Treaty, right? The December 1987 agreement that ultimately did away with this entire class of weapons. The story is, to be sure, one of dramatic change in superpower relations, of how US-Soviet relations went from the lows of the early 1980s to moments like this one, and ultimately the dismantling of the Cold War entirely before the decade was through. But just as common were scenes like this one. Here we can see hundreds of thousands 
assembled in the West German capital of Bonn to oppose NATO's plans to deploy the Glickums and Pershing IIs, those missiles I introduced you to at the beginning, in Western Europe. Though, as you can see, uh, their opposition from crowds like this one was always about more than just the deployment. You have banners here calling for everything from neutrality to an end to NATO membership, uh, asking Spain, who had just recently joined the alliance in 1982, to promptly reject their newfound alliance membership. To explain why the Euro missiles mattered, I quickly concluded that it was not enough to look at these two phenomena in isolation, to treat superpower diplomacy as distinct from social movements and activism like this moment. It was critical for me to bring these two together, to put widespread social movements in conversation with issues of nuclear strategy, arms control talks, superpower diplomacy, and intra-alliance politics. And so in the book, I shift the frame. Rather than focus of one, on one dimension of the Euro missiles, be that relations between the superpowers or within social movements and activist groups, I opted to put NATO at the center. In other words, to consider the interaction between alliance politics, electoral politics, and superpower politics. It was a choice that ultimately shaped how I approached the process of researching this book. The book draws on deep archival work from across the Atlantic Alliance in member states, both large and small, as well as the official holdings of the NATO archives. I conducted research in presidential records and prime ministerial papers, along with foreign ministry, defense ministry, and intelligence records from Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands. I want to give you just one example of what this turned up. Here's one characteristically blunt assessment from the French Foreign Ministry archives just outside Paris. And for those of you who don't read French, the point one is still pretty easy to translate. The French are handy like that, right? Making clear that the entire issue of modernizing theater nuclear forces, of upgrading NATO's capabilities, introducing these new weapons in Western Europe, was fundamentally at its heart about the Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany, about keeping West Germany anchored within the alliance. And this is a theme that I draw out in a fair bit of detail throughout the book, and I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A if it's of interest. The use of a multinational source base was not just about providing different perspectives, like the French, or assessments of a complex alliance, or even moving beyond treatments focused solely on the biggest of the NATO allies. It was also driven by the realities of doing contemporary history. <laughs> on, despite the fact that some documents do seem to go rogue in Washington, uh, on sensitive questions like nuclear issues, there's still plenty of information withheld. It's true if you're writing about the 1980s, the 1970s, the 1960s, even earlier. Governments, for all the understandable reasons, and some extra ones we're probably not thinking of, are reluctant to share sensitive information. And so even with records dating back 50 years, it is pretty normal to see a lot of pages like this one. I promise I saw more than I would care to count in the process of researching this book. I also concluded that institutional records were not enough. And I looked for ways to capture the perspectives and arguments of activists to understand why and how they mobilized against the Euro missiles. In part, this was a desire to move beyond some of the ideologically inflected charges and polemics, the arguments that were so popular and divisive in the early 1980s, convinced that those who opposed the Euro missiles were nothing more than Soviet stooges or useful idiots. In doing that research, it took me to a whole different kind of records, not formal, neatly organized papers of a presidential administration, but pamphlets, newsletters, informal meeting minutes. I watched a lot of television news clips, a lot of YouTube videos. It was a totally different kind of research, but turned up wonderful pieces of material like this 1986 pamphlet produced by the British-based Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, which I photographed at the London School of Economics. And you can see here some, uh, they had a knack for some really great slogans, right? Uh, deploying old tropes, right? This slogan, over-armed, over-eager, over here, harkens back directly to the things that were said about American soldiers based in the United Kingdom during the Second World War. Uh, you know, 
playing on British concerns and anxieties about the erosion of their own sovereignty being turned into a landing strip or an air base uh, for the uh, projection of American power over the continent. So what is the end result of this? It's a book that draws on written material and archival collections from eight countries and over two dozen repositories on a whole slew of photographs and popular culture from the time and published media. I used all of these sources in conversation to try and tell a new story that captured an array of perspectives and a long history of the Euro missiles in transatlantic perspective. For me personally, this might be my Canadian showing, but it was critical for me to write a history of NATO that was not, at the end of the day, just a history of US foreign policy, but rather about the complexity and chaos, frankly, of NATO as an alliance. So what do I argue in the book? I locate the origins of this issue over the Euro missiles in structural elements about how NATO works as an alliance and has worked since its founding in the late 1940s. The issue of the Euro missiles at its most basic was framed by the difficulties and tensions of the post-war transatlantic bargain. And chief among them, as this image makes so clear, are the problems of allied defense. Since the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty in 1949, the Western Allies had struggled and often failed to figure out how to provide for a sufficient defense. So if we look at a map like this one, if you were going to design an alliance in your ideal world, NATO is exactly the opposite of what you would want. You would never want to design an alliance where you need to defend countries along a divided continent and your main source of power to do so is an ocean away. You've got this 6,000 kilometer distance that you need to move men, supplies, material, and you need to do that quickly to stop this giant land power next to you, over here, this ominous red one, from steamrolling all of your allies. That is the perennial problem of NATO at its most basic. And that problem doesn't go anywhere. That problem still exists today. In a different form, that inner European border is a little further east now, uh, as we well know from watching the news but some of the basic problems are still there. It created this structure, created perennial problems about how the United States could credibly project power, and even more importantly, provide sufficient reassurance. So much of NATO's history is about the intangibles, right? Feeling confidence that the alliance is hanging together, confidence that the United States is really going to come to the defense of its Western European allies. It's really fuzzy. And the things that people think will reassure their allies don't always work. Everybody, reassurance is in the eye of the beholder. It's not a shock to anyone familiar with NATO's history that this project of extending deterrence, right, trying to defend all of Western Europe with US military power, particularly the power of US nuclear weapons, was always fraught in the NATO context with recurring bouts of skepticism. And that is the fundamental kernel of the story that I tell in this book. The problems of a credible extended deter deterrent appeared time and again, so much so that as a writer, it was almost painful to not repeat myself, lest I put the reader to sleep. In the book, I follow these debates from the immediate aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s through the end of the Cold War, pushing beyond, beyond that historic moment where Reagan and Gorbachev signed the INF Treaty that I showed you earlier. But for our purposes today, I wanna to dig into just a few critical episodes. The first is about the origins of this issue. So the conventional wisdom of the Euro missiles as a story is usually a pretty clean arc, that there is a neat origin in the 1970s, the crisis reaches its height in the mid early 1980s, and then has its denouement with that historic and so much photographed occasion between Reagan and Gorbachev. I'm gonna do that classic historian thing where I tell you, that's wrong. It's way more complicated than that. 
It's fun how that's always our party trick that we often say, but it really is more complicated than that. So the conventional wisdom holds that the entire issue of the Euro missiles began with the Soviet deployment of new missiles, the weapon pictured here, uh, the SS-20, which these deployments began in the mid-1970s. These weapons were a significant upgrade in Soviet capabilities in the European theater from the earlier generation of medium and intermediate range missiles that the Soviet Union had deployed in the late 1950s. These SS-20s, mercifully for the Soviets at least, had a little bit better stability. The previous generation had this pesky habit of blowing up on the launch pad because they relied on unstable liquid fuel. So the Soviets were a little bit happier with, uh, with this new, more modern uh, weaponry. And so in the conventional telling, it's these weapons, the Soviet SS-20s, that pose a new threat to Western Europe and force NATO to respond with deployments of its own. NATO's response, as the story so often goes, is spurred by a speech given by the West German Chancellor of the day, Helmut Schmidt, at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London in October of 1977. And with Schmidt sounding the alarm on this crisis, this deliberation culminates in NATO's December 1979 dual track decision, which I'll come back to in a moment. That conventional wisdom is wrong. The arrival of the Soviet SS-20s only exacerbated and added to a problem that already existed and had for many years. The Western Allies, particularly the West Germans, were already concerned about the implications of what they termed parity between the United States and the Soviet Union. But in essence, the belief that the strategic nu nuclear arsenals of both the United States and the Soviet Union had become so large that they would neutralize one another and that that would leave Europe exposed, right? That the extended deterrence that the United States hoped to hold out like an umbrella over Western Europe would no longer be so credible if and when a rainstorm or nuclear war came. This was made worse by the signing of the first agreement to limit strategic weapons between the two superpowers, the 1972 agreement signed by Nixon and Brezhnev, SALT I. In the wake of SALT I and the superpowers' decision to cap their strategic arsenals at an equal level, the West Germans in particular worried that this newfound parity would erode the U.S. ability to protect West Germany from political blackmail or military threat. But even after the deployment of the SS-20s, the degree to which these new weapons actually posed a risk to NATO was far from clear. So the West Germans, as I just told you, were alarmed worried about the rise of a distinct threat in Europe, facing the Europeans separate from relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, what they often referred to in characteristically clunky language as the Euro strategic balance. And this raised the specter of decoupling, a sort of classic boogeyman in the NATO landscape where officials worried that the US ability to protect Western Europe might no longer work. But the successive administrations in Washington in this time, that of Gerald Ford and of Jimmy Carter, offered repeated assurances to their allies in Western Europe that these new Soviet missiles actually did nothing to change the overall balance of power. The United States, they were confident, or so they told their allies, could absolutely protect Western Europe all the way up to the Fulda Gap with, uh, from Soviet political pressure or military invasion. So, how do we get from this point where the Carter administration says, don't worry about these new weapons, to them deciding in just a few short years that they need to deploy an entire new generation of ground-based missiles to Western Europe? That's the result of another nuclear issue, that over the enhanced radiation warhead, a weapon better known as the neutron bomb. In the summer of 1977, press leaks drew attention to this new tactical weapon buried in the budget of a seemingly arcane US government agency. And it quickly set off a firestorm and galvanized protesters. It stoked a resurgence of anti-nuclear activism after years in the doldrums, bringing it to heights not seen since the late 1950s or early 1960s. And the allies against mounting public opposition, a fraction of it stoked and bankrolled by Warsaw Pact intelligence agencies, struggled to cobble together a plan for how they would actually deploy these new enhanced radiation warheads, these anti-tank systems. 
that was a painstaking effort, uh, too boring for me to recount here, to be honest, uh, as they struggled to cobble together an agreement. It was a task that occupied much of the winter and spring of 1977 and into 1978. And then, when the Allies were finally on the verge of approving a complicated three-part package to deploy these weapons, the president, Jimmy Carter, pulled the plug. No more plan. That decision was roundly criticized. And Carter's choice to walk away from the neutron bomb was taken as evidence of all the worst things people already speculated about Jimmy Carter and his leadership by the spring of 1978. He was accused of moralistic temporizing and a complete and utter lack of leadership. In the press, aides of the West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt and his coalition partner and foreign minister Hans Dietrich Genscher openly mocked Carter. They derided him as a religious dreamer and were convinced that the Carter administration was, in the words of one Genscher aide, a leaderless hen coop. Carter, for his part, refused to let the members of his own administration push back on those claims. He concluded that the cost would be too high if it caused any more difficulty in the administration's dealing with Helmut Schmidt or the West Germans in general. And I should say, for those of you who don't know, this is not a happy relationship. These are two men who do not love one another. I think that's maybe putting it mildly. Uh, Carter aides later described Schmidt as a know-it-all, uh, convinced that he would make a better president if only he had been eligible for the post. The political fallout of Carter's decision to cancel the neutron bomb, and particularly the intense firestorm and critique that came from the West Germans, made it virtually impossible for the Carter administration to ignore other West German concerns about how viable NATO's extended deterrent was and whether NATO's strategy of flexible response, this kind of wild amorphous scheme where there would be a chain of escalation to reassure that you know, Soviet pressure could be met at every level, except in practice, of course, a chain of escalation meant limited nuclear war, theater nuclear war, general nuclear war, uh, then they had these wild things like, we will reestablish deterrence after general nuclear war, which is something I don't really like to think a lot about because uh, it's a worrying that smart people thought that that was a viable option. So only in the wake of the political fallout of the neutron bomb does the Carter administration really come around to the idea that maybe they need to do something to reassure their West German allies. And maybe the solution to that problem is, at least in part, to deploy new missiles, ground-based missiles, to Western Europe. Now, it took another 18 months to reach agreement. Being a historian of NATO means you mostly just read a lot of meetings. It's a good thing that the history of NATO is mostly meetings because the alternatives were much worse. But it takes a long time for an alliance of 16, 15, 16, 30, however many members there are of the day to reach an agreement. And so what resulted was a complicated arrangement in two basic parts. It became known by the incredibly creative name, the dual track decision. Track one, track two. Two parts, dual track decision. So the first track was to deploy new ground-based missiles to Western Europe. Those are those Griffins and Pershing twos, the Glickhams and Pershing twos I mentioned up top. The West Germans, however, were insistent that even though, if we think about a map of Cold War Europe, West Germany would be the logical place to station these weapons, they could not be alone in shouldering the burden of accepting those new missiles. These were the first ground-based missiles of that class and capability that would be deployed in uh, NATO Europe since the early 1960s. And so the Germans are very hesitant to be alone, isolated in taking on those weapons. Uh, so in order to avoid what West German policymakers unfortunately termed singularization, the decision cobbled together this wild burden sharing scheme in order to spread out some of the political pressure. The first of the allies to offer was the United Kingdom. They would host a, a set of American missiles. But the British didn't really meet the West German criteria. Uh, the West Germans really wanted another NATO ally that didn't have a nuclear weapons program of its own and was on the continent. Well, strike one and strike two against the British. 
So great that the British are willing to do it, but the alliance goes in search of other partners. They get the Italians on board who really want to increase their political voice in the alliance. And so the Italians offer to take a, a slate of the missiles that'll be hosted in Sicily. And then because banking on Italian politics might not be the most secure strategy, mm -hmm. they also approach the Belgians and the Dutch. But even this is a little bit risky. Already uh, in that neutron bomb episode that I just talked about, huge protests had broken out primarily in the Netherlands and, and to some degree spilled over into Belgium. So it's already pretty iffy whether the Belgians and the Dutch are gonna go along. But so this first track of the decision has this, these five basing countries. The second track then, that second piece of the dual track decision is that the United States is going to undertake arms control negotiations in parallel on these same systems. So offering that they won't deploy these, we these new weapons if the Soviet Union agrees to reduce the SS-20s that it's already uh, introducing into Europe. So this decision was a classic product of alliance wrangling and it expressed a degree of consensus, but I lean heavily on the word degree. Uh, virtually no one shared a common understanding about what the underlying logic or relationship between the deployment track and the arms control track was in this decision. So some saw the deployments as absolutely necessary in order to shore up the strategy of escalation envisioned in flexible response. Others believed that the, that the deployments would be useful primarily as a bargaining chip in order to secure reductions in the Soviet arsenal. And in order to reach the dual track decision, the allies basically sidestepped this question and never answered it. They agreed that these two interpretations could exist, coexist in the final decision, however uncomfortably. As long as you didn't talk about it, it was fine. That's a, usually a NATO solution for things. So if these deployments envisioned in the December 1979 decision were uh, planned for December or for the fall of 1983, right? This weird four-year time lag. If they were intended as reassurance, they created anxiety. The dual track decision was part of a string of rapid problems in U.S.-Soviet relations. U.S.-Soviet relations weren't exactly wonderful in the late 1970s, divided over everything from human rights uh, to whether or not they could reach an arms control agreement. But the dual track decision and another major shock in December 1979 send the relationship from bad to worse, that being the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan two weeks after NATO's dual track decision. And so with superpower relations in a free fall, you have widespread and heightened concern that the Cold War had suddenly returned to Europe, that after the seeming peace and prosperity, the absence of the Cold War in the 1970s, it was back with a vengeance. You had mounting fears of nuclear annihilation, which came to define the early 1980s. If we think about the popular culture of the day, there are mushroom clouds everywhere. Think about war games. Uh, the famous Nana song, 99 Red Balloons, where some rogue red balloons happen to set off a nuclear war. You think about Threads, or even the James Bond franchise, where the supervillain is going to blow up the world in the wonderfully titled film, Octopussy. <coughs> These fears were amplified by a new president. Ronald Reagan seemed by many, for better or for worse, to be an anti-Soviet hawk, willing to talk tough and spend reams of money to defeat the Soviet Union. His early rhetoric added fuel to the fire, dismissing detente as a relic of the past and talking about the need to banish communism, right? To leave communism on the ash heap of history, referring to the Soviet Union as an evil empire. And a few people who worked for Reagan didn't help these problems, remarking in offhand quips that everybody could survive a nuclear war so long as there were enough shovels. Needless to say, that didn't exactly comfort uh, many in the United States, in Canada, but certainly not in Europe where they were expected to live alongside these new US missiles that NATO was planning to introduce in 1983. Understandably, a few people came to the conclusion, or at least worried that it was possible that the Cold War might turn hot, that Europe as a continent would be turned into a nuclear battleground. I wanna give you a, a few fun examples I turned up 
Here is a young Elizabeth. Uh, so she has great handwriting for a, a, a young elementary schooler, right? But I think expressed the fears of many. Uh, please, 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 will you stop nuclear weapons? I want to have fun, but with nuclear war, I wouldn't have fun. <laughs> I share Elizabeth's feelings. I think she's onto something here. <laughs> this, this was the take of uh, British socialists. I, there is an apocryphal story, and I have never been able to confirm it, but apparently President Reagan had a copy of this hanging in uh, the shed in the ranch at his California house. I, I have heard through the grapevine. I've never found enough to confirm it. But so you can see here the message of British socialists who saw a generation of conservative politicians all too enamored with the power of nuclear weapons. And if you dig into some of the smaller text, you can see how they associated this deeply with conservative economics of the day. So if you can see down here uh, at the bottom, right, in the left-hand corner, this is an IMF picture. Uh, in the right-hand corner, it says Right Rank, Inc. Uh, at the top, right, Milton Friedman in association with Pentagon Productions. Uh, I believe it is directed by Hank Kissinger and in a good ode to British politics, uh, music by Eddie Heath, right, the former, uh, one of Thatcher's predecessors. This was also a message that traveled. So I want you to take another look at this image that I showed you from that protest in Bonn. There's Ronnie and Maggie right there on the placard in the front. This is why it was fun to do work, not just in presidential archives, as great as they are. Protests rocked Western Europe and North America. These Dutch activists, for instance, cruised the canals of Rotterdam in a creatively titled Cruise Against Cruise. Widespread popular opposition to nuclear weapons provided ample openings for the Soviet Union and its allies to try and stop NATO's deployments called for in the dual track decision. They amplified homegrown dissent and provided funds and carefully calibrated messaging to maximize discontent. But I want to be crystal clear. The critics of the Euro missiles and of NATO's deployments came from diverse backgrounds and political traditions. They opposed the missiles on a variety of grounds in a big and unruly common cause. Some of them had an understandable fear of nuclear war, not unlike young Elizabeth. Some of them rejected the underlying logic of continuing the Cold War competition with the Soviet Union. Others rejected, uh, had religious objections and worried about the morality of nuclear deterrence. Feminists objected to the patriarchal nature of everything about the nuclear weapons industry, uh, pointing to language like transporter, erector, launcher as maybe a sign that it, there was a lot of like masculine energy that was pretty bad in that space. Against this backdrop, let's see, there we go. Against this backdrop, the United States and the Soviet Union did negotiate. In the fall of 1981, talks opened in Geneva on what were then called Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, or INF. But these talks were fundamentally bound up in efforts to win hearts and minds across Western Europe, which meant that even as the superpowers engaged in real dialogue at the negotiating table in Geneva, these talks were often dismissed as little more than a public relations stunt. Oh, I lost it here. There we go. And despite immense pressure, record-breaking demonstrations across the Atlantic Alliance, those deployments ultimately went ahead on schedule, at least in some of the basin countries in 1983. Votes in the British, Italian, and West German parliaments all voted to take their share of the NATO missiles, despite scenes like this one from October 1983 in Bonn. And when the West Germans voted to take the weapons, not when the British voted, not when the Italians voted, but when the West Germans, the third country to vote in favor of the deployments, said yes, the Soviet Union responded by walking out of the arms control talks in Geneva. Another reminder of the degree to which this competition was really about what role Germany would play in Cold War Europe. There was then a subsequent rapid transformation. In just four short years, 
The situation went from the Soviet negotiators walking out of the arms control talks to Reagan and Gorbachev signing the INF Treaty. And I cannot overstate the degree to which that was a product of this man, Mikhail Gorbachev, his thinking and his diplomacy. It was ultimately Gorbachev who was willing to untie the arms control package to reach a deal on limiting the Euro missiles without keeping it pegged to the Strategic Defense Initiative. I can talk more about that mechanism if anybody's interested in Gorbachev's thinking there. Gorbachev, in doing so, was ultimately willing to accept an undeniably lopsided deal with clear US advantages. The Soviet Union and the INF Treaty destroyed 1,000 more missiles than the United States did, and the Soviets agreed to a much more aggressive inspection regime than they had ever agreed to in previous arms control talks. The treaty also preserved immense US technological advantages. The United States and the Soviet Union dismantled and destroyed every ground-based missile from 500 to 5,500 kilometers with global scope, something the United States had insisted on, which would hamstring the Soviet Union's ability to counter the Chinese nuclear program on its border. But it left air and sea launched capabilities where the United States had a decisive advantage untouched. And if we think about the, United, the way the United States fought wars in the 1990s, it was those air launched and sea launched cruise missiles that were so critical to much of uh, the US war fighting capability. Now, we might think that the story ends here with Reagan and Gorbachev signing this historic and lopsided deal. But the aftermath of the INF Treaty caused a whole new round of angst within NATO. As the alliance confronted familiar difficulties about how credible extended deterrence would be with the removal of those those same weapon systems that they had worked so hard to deploy in the early 1980s, with the removal of the Glickhams and Pershing twos. This new round of problems focused primarily on a set of weapons left outside the INF Treaty. These short-range nuclear forces, or SNF, with a range under 500 kilometers. So mostly tactical and battlefield weapons uh, that were due for modernization. Now if we dwell for just a moment and imagine in your mind that, that Cold War map that I showed you, blue and red with the division of Europe, if you have a weapon system that's with a range under 500 kilometers, you're going to station it in basically one place, Germany. It's got to be close to the border. It has to be close to that inner German gap. So needless to say that this caused particular problems for the West Germans as it drew attention to nearly every uncomfortable reality of their position as a divided nation straddling the front lines of the Cold War. These problems were made all the more acute and emotional by the fact that the peak of this debate over modernization was coming to a head in the spring of 1989. And as one uh, prominent West German politician put it, what better way to mark the 50th anniversary of the Nazi invasion of Poland than to deploy new missiles designed only to strike either other Germans or Poland. Mostly that public criticism Ex which existed within the government, uh, divided Helmut Kohl's coalition and, and uh, spurred new rounds of public protest was summed up by a pithy but rather morbid slogan. The shorter the range, the deader the German. I, that's always where people like don't know whether they're supposed to laugh or not. <laughs> uh, one person in particular uh, chafed at West German opposition to modernizing these weapons, these short range systems, and that was Margaret Thatcher. She was at this point convinced that the West Germans had an outsized role in NATO's decision making, something that was particularly uncomfortable as it meant a commensurate loss of her own influence or of Britain's influence in NATO's decision making. She was particularly fearful that a swell of popular opposition coupled with the deft diplomacy that Mikhail Gorbachev was so famous for by 1989 would leave the Western allies exposed, facing pressure to go for yet another zero option, this time to remove a whole class of short range systems. And that the result would be a steady slide into the complete denuclearization of Europe, the unraveling of NATO's deterrent, US conventional forces leaving the continent, and ultimately, with it all, the foundations of peace in post-war Europe. And so even in 1989, 
there was real meaningful concern about the durability of NATO's policies, whether NATO could in fact continue to go on as it had since its founding in 1949. The earlier deliberations, many concluded over the Euro missiles, had fractured the security consensus in key countries, not least the West, uh, in, in West Germany. So could the alliance, many wondered, still maintain a posture based as it was on nuclear weapons? In the end, that was a question made null and void by events on the other side of the Iron Curtain. It ended up swept away with the Berlin Wall and with the communist regimes of Eastern Europe. But that sense of fragility, whether the still fresh debates over SNF modernization or the scars of, er of earlier difficulties remained. And against that backdrop, I don't think it's very difficult for us to see and appreciate why so many allied policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic were eager to see NATO preserved and play a vital role in the emerging and uncertain post-Cold War order. By way of conclusion, I've talked plenty long enough, I wanna flag a few key takeaways. The first, I think, in the book is that I highlight a critical aspect of presidential politics, but one that we often don't pay very much attention to, which is that there is a significant gap between how the president is perceived in public and the actual policies made by the president. And this is something that is sharpened as we can go back and look into the historical record. I think this is true of any number of the presidents that I cover in the book, but it's particularly true of Ronald Reagan. Uh, and I think Reagan makes a, a fascinating case in this respect. Here was a man with an incredible number of contradictions. He was widely seen as a bombastic warmonger, and yet he genuinely believed in the need for a nuclear free world. He was a nuclear abolitionist. Historians will debate that, but I think the record is pretty clear. And even people who fundamentally disagreed with him, whether Margaret Thatcher or Ken Edelman, who worked for him, agree that that was one of the most shocking things when they discovered that Reagan really was committed to a world without nuclear weapons. But when he said so, loudly and often in public venues, many people, including some of his own advisors, assumed that it was little more than an attempt to make public criticism of the administration go away, to reassure critics that he wasn't quite the hawk or warmonger the saber rattler that he had been depicted as. People assumed it was the advice of advisors or maybe even of Nancy, his wife, not the genuine belief of the president. There's a great occasion where Reagan's second secretary of state, his much more successful se secretary of state, uh, George Shultz, in 1986, after uh, Reagan and Gorbachev have met for the Reykjavik summit, and there's been this near moment where they're talking about a world without nuclear weapons in the year 2000, where Schultz gets a lot of pushback uh, within the arms control group in the State Department. And he finally just has to lay down the line and say, you've tried to convince the president. He doesn't agree with you. He wants a world without nuclear weapons. It's your job to do it. And I think that sometimes that is difficult. Uh, it's certainly contentious uh, for, and I'm not gonna end the historical debate on that because it is so against what the popular reputation in some circles of Reagan was in the 1980s. Then the second thing that I wanna flag taking us up to the present is a classic historian's reminder. It is all too tempting to look back at the episode that I've talked about here and see it as that perfect arc. The rise, climax, and fall with this incredible deal that ends, seems to end the Cold War, to signal a new relationship between Reagan and Gorbachev, between the United States and the Soviet Union. That neat narrative arc gives people confidence that we can somehow export that experience, we can repeat it over again. I've read an upsetting number of times about how we'll just deploy new missiles in, uh, in Asia and then we'll get a deal with the Chinese. That'll be, that, that's gonna fix, fix the, the US-Chinese competition. The story I tell in the book, I think, and I hope, should give those people pause. The Cold War was not guaranteed to end the way that it did, without nuclear conflict in Europe or with NATO fully intact. And as those re events recede into the past, I think we would do well to remember how easily it might have turned out another way. With that, I'll leave it there and look forward to your questions. <laughs>
Uh, we do have time for questions, and if, as we always do, please uh, wait for the microphone to get to you so we can make sure that everybody can hear the question, uh, and I will let you take it up for here. Yeah. Please, go ahead. <laughs> yep. Yes, thanks very much. You explained it, but one thing that still puzzles me is why they thought we needed these interrange missiles anyway, because we have ICBMs now that protect, and they're sort of the, you know, mad and keeps us from using nuke weapons. So, you know, why did we really do that? And you, you, you tried to explain it, but was some of it maybe the defense industry wanted more money and to develop stuff? Was, was that ever a reason in there that you ever saw or considered? The, the biggest driver in the production, whether it's the research, development, procurement, deployment of these weapons, is really this puzzle of how you are going to protect the allies in Western Europe. And so it's this fuzzy concept of reassurance. How are you going to convince every government from West Germany to Belgium to Italy to the United Kingdom to our uh, very thorny allies in France that you are going to be there, that you can provide sufficient deterrence to protect them, right? So the, the Euro big European fear during the Cold War is that war is going to happen, right? That there is going to be a war in Europe, conventional, nuclear, they don't want any of it. And so the idea is to, in their mind, is to make deterrence as ironclad as possible. But this has a, a paradoxical logic which is that in order in an age of ICBMs and of this mutually assured destruction to make that defense credible, they conclude that they need to deploy more weapons to Western Europe stationed among them so they can meet the Soviet threat at every level. So to deter the Soviet Union from probing operations, from political blackmail, through theater incursions, right? This is the idea behind flexible response, that you're going to have this they use all these uh, metaphors for it, that you're gonna have this chain of escalation, this seamless robe of deterrence, but that you're gonna be able to meet the Soviet Union at every single level up that chain of escalation so that the Soviet Union doesn't try anything at all. And so stationing the missiles in Western Europe is really about signaling with their presence in Western Europe that the United States is not gonna retreat and only defend itself, but that it is there to defend the Western Europeans as well, to make sure that that war never comes. But then why did they drop it if that was the reason? It's a good question, right? I told you that there were multiple logics based within the same thing. This is a huge source of uh, debate in 1986 and 1987 when it is increasingly clear that Reagan and Gorbachev are willing to do a deal that might get rid of these weapons. Uh, Nearly everybody had accepted the initial proposal for a zero option, right, getting rid of these weapons, because they assumed the Soviet Union would never take it. And once it becomes possible, it sets the cat among the pigeons in the alliance. Uh, you have widespread, particularly British and French, anxiety about what it will mean, uh, whether it will destroy uh, the ability to have a nuclear defense of NATO at all. So the, the short answer to your question is, because NATO is an unwieldy alliance where not everybody agrees. And so you have two schools of thought, one wins out at one point, and then one logic wins out at a later date. But it was a source of considerable debate. Oh. Is, is an underlying issue in this whole, whole thing for the United States and the other NATO allies that West Germany could at some point determine that it was in its interest to become neutral and to leave NATO and become like Austria? Yeah, this is the underlying political uh, worry, not just in this episode, but I think through much of NATO's history during the Cold War, which when I lecture to my students, they often think that I'm making that up, right? That, uh, that but Germany, Germany is such a, you know, peaceful country now. And I, but if we go back and we think, think about someone like Margaret Thatcher. She had come of age at a time where she remembered the Second World War. She was worried, she knew enough European history back to 1871 to have some deep-rooted concerns about the nature of German politics and German militarism. Uh, in the 1960s and the Johnson years, there's a, a colorful, though rather unfortunate and certainly unflattering assessment produced uh, in the administration that uh, the Germans might be like alcoholics. They had recovered at this time, but if they went back to the bottle, 
uh, this would be a big problem. And so the archival record is littered with references to previous moments in history where the Germans had done a deal with the Soviet Union. So uh, references to the Treaty of Rapallo in 1922, when Germany and the Soviet Union on the, the sidelines sort of cast out from the European state system had done a deal, uh, or even more unfortunate references to 1939 and the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And so there always was this underlying concern that the West Germans might be somehow peeled away from the alliance, that they could be lured in, maybe not fully into the Soviet orbit or, or into the Warsaw Pact, but that they could be neutralized. Uh, the buzzword of the Cold War was often Finlandization, right, a reference to Finland's sort of peculiar status where it had no real control over its foreign policy, but had some freedom to, uh, for maneuver in domestic policy. And so referring to Finlandization as a, as a threat that West Germany would somehow be Finlandized. And all of that is to say that uh, the Cold War competition, at least in Europe, was so much about a struggle for German power. What would happen to the sort of latent power at the heart of the continent of Germany? And so it's uh, no coincidence that when, uh, when Soviet negotiators, for instance, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back to convince them to walk out of the talks is not when the British accept these weapons, but when the West Germans do. The negotiator that the Soviets appointed was an old German uh, specialist who had spent time in both East and West Germany. So it was really about, uh, in many respects, Germany's place uh, in the European system. That's a great question. First of all, I'm gonna ask you, an unfair question for a historian because you're looking at it from the snapshot of when you're looking at it back in the late 90s, 80s, 90s, turn of the century. And now we have with 20 years more experience, 22 years more experience, we have somebody who's not Gorbachev. Putin is not Gorbachev, never was, never will be. And uh, the problem is that in entering into an agreement with the Soviets and then Russia, to be friends. We were friends for a while, but in, in the 90s and you know, around 2000. But did, we could not have predicted that another dictator would rise, although I think it's fair to say it usually happens anyway, but we couldn't predict that, and we needed to still have some kind of deterrence with Russia. We don't have that deterrence right now. We have some ICBMs, I guess, but uh, we don't have the kind of deterrence we had during the Cold War, during the height of the Cold War in the 70s. No, uh, though technological advances mean that the situation is quite different and NATO relies primarily, I mean, we do have deterrence that we extend over our NATO allies in Western Europe. We just no longer rely on ground-based systems. We rely on air-launched systems primarily. Uh, so kind of reverting to what we had done in the period between 1963 uh, and 1970. Yeah, but Russia well, is a vast, vast territory. And uh, you don't have any air-launched systems that can actually bring down Russia. Now, if you're, if you're going to aim, if you're going to aim strategically at Moscow, you're going to wreak some havoc in Moscow. But Russia cannot be controlled; it can only be dealt with, can only be uh, uh, neutralized with negotiations and give them something. So they came up with this idea, obviously Putin did, that I'm going to take the weakest sister, and that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, we're, going to, we're going to pick on somebody that we can defeat and stick it in the eye of the United States. And, and we're, we're saying, Germany, you're next. Poland, you're next. What is, the, what is there to keep Russia in its place, to keep Putin in his place? I, I, I would take issue with the assessment that uh, the Russians have, have taken on a conflict with somebody that they can easily defeat. They I thought they could. I think the, yeah, sure. They miscalculated. Yeah. I think the Ukrainians have shown full well that they are willing to put up a fight and they've got something to fight for. And I think most of the NATO allies have also shown that. I mean, NATO is an unruly institution and it's huge now. Uh, and certainly not all of the NATO allies share the same assessment of how much NATO should do to support the Ukrainian war effort. But there is a remarkable degree of support, uh, even from countries that... I would not have guessed before February of last year uh, that would be so on board. Uh, and I'm 
skeptical of how much the change in German foreign policy is a real change, but it is telling that even the Germans and the French are talking about a new kind of relationship with the Russians. Uh, it's, a, it's a thorny problem, to be sure. Uh, there are no quick fixes for the fact that Russia is no longer a great power, but possesses many of the trappings of a great power. I'm glad that we have smart people in Washington who are thinking about that problem. Thank you, Dr. Coburn. Um, Professor William Spaniel of uh, University of Pittsburgh has argued that uh, intermediate um, nuclear forces have become less of a geostrategic factor and more of a tactical factor, uh, decreasing its influence in international politics while also increasing the threat of small-scale deployment. I want to know what is your opinion on that change from um, a strategic to a tactical weapon as uh, nuclear forces, and how does how is nuclear deployment in the future of European affairs going to change with the, the resurgence of interstate conflicts like the Russia-Ukrainian war? Yeah, uh, I will. I'll give you sort of two answers. Uh, one is that uh, it is a, in my opinion, a complete misnomer. Uh, to distinguish between tactical nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons. And I will lean on the words of Helmut Schmidt here, who was a, before being chancellor, uh, was a prominent defense analyst in the early 1960s, that it's all well and good for Americans to talk about the difference between strategic nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons. But if a nuclear weapon hits my house, that's a strategic event. Right? Uh, and so there is, uh, there, the destructive power of nuclear weapons is such that it, it's easy in theory and in abstraction to make those distinctions, but in practice about what it means, and particularly in an alliance system as complex as ours is in Europe and in Asia, we have to bear those things in mind, right? That, uh, that it is not tactical for those who are facing the prospect of being hit with those tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, the other thing to say is that people have made that argument since the 1950s. Uh, everything has a history. And so the, the idea that somehow we are getting new technologies that are blurring the lines between tactical and nuclear war, uh, and strategic weapons, we've been there before. Uh, and I'm more concerned looking at uh, at current and, and where the trends seem to be heading about the blurring of the lines between conventional capabilities and nuclear capabilities. Because now we are seeing such advanced breakthroughs in conventional weapons, particularly the kinds of things that are in R&D right now, that say the Department of the Army is looking to field, uh, that poses real problems for arms control uh, and for deterrence, right, for both sides of that coin uh, in thinking about how we are going to manage uh, risk with our adversaries, whether that's with Russia or with China. First of all, thank you very much for coming and sharing the, the nine years of work that you've done. Um, you've been helping us look backwards. Looking forward, um, it's been widely reported that uh, President Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons as tactical weapons in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, for your perspective of what the likelihood of that is happening, and conversely with, with what you've been talking about tonight, what would NATO do collectively and as individual uh, nations uh, if that were to happen? Yeah. Uh, this is one of the sad things about writing a book is when um, no historian of nuclear weapons and nuclear war wants to be timely. Uh, and it's been uh, a little bit upsetting to uh, have so much have contemporary relevance uh, since even I finished writing the book manuscript as well as in production. Um, I am not going to shock anyone here when I say that uh, I am not a psychologist and President Putin is a particularly difficult person to analyze from uh, an armchair distance. I think many people at the CIA are trying to do that. And uh, you know, I don't envy them in that task. Uh, but I think that fundamentally, there are so many reasons why Putin can threaten to do that. And there is a value in threatening, right, in reminding the world that he does have this one very significant piece of great power uh, capability left. And there's a big distance between making that clear 
in his like very oblique ways that he likes to do so uh, in, in public speeches and actually using them. Uh, and if we run through the scenarios and options where Putin might use them, nearly all of them are bad for the Russians, right? So people speculate about, oh, there'll be a demonstrative uh, show of force, like a shot across the, the bow over the Black Sea. And then what's he gonna achieve? He's gonna irradiate some fish. He will make the Turks really angry who are a useful asset to him in sticking you know, a, a thorn in the side of many of the NATO allies. He's going to use them where in Ukraine if he wishes to use them. I mean, if he uses them in eastern Ukraine, that's the part that ostensibly he would like to keep uh, as Russian territory. Uh, using them in western Ukraine, there is an immense risk that you uh, misfire and hit Poland. And given how well the conventional pieces of the Russian military have been performing, I don't think that many, even if Putin has confidence that might work, I'm not sure the people in the chain responsible for actually seeing through the detonation of a nuclear weapon have the same degree of confidence in, in that arsenal. So I would say, I mean, the risk is always higher than we would like because it's higher than zero. But I would say I have, I don't have a lot of confidence about Putin in most things, but this is one place where I, I'm, I, I'm not as concerned as, uh, as some, some people are. Uh, but that being said, I think then the question of what NATO would do is gets to a much bigger sort of existential question about NATO, which is why has the alliance survived? And in part, it's because that question has never been called, right? Is the United States actually going to do all the things it promised to do if and when the day nobody hopes arrives comes? And I'm sure that this is a source of considerable concern uh, in Washington. I would anticipate, I'm a historian, right? But I'll, I'll freelance a little here in the present. Uh, I would anticipate that NATO's response uh, were, were that to transpire would be almost entirely conventional. Uh, I think they would be reluctant to meet tit for tat and respond with nuclear weapons. And that given the strength, particularly of Western intelligence gathering in Russia, which we've already seen on display with the ability of the Ukrainian forces to target uh, key Russian uh, battlefield assets, that they would try to, say, do a demonstrative retaliatory conventional strike against the unit that fired nuclear weapons or something like that. Uh, I think it would be critical for the NATO allies to not respond like for like. But of course, that is in a speculative scenario where, say, uh, Putin fires a nuclear weapon at Ukraine or the Black Sea. If he accidentally hits Poland or Romania or something of the like, that's a very different scenario. But I think, you know, there's the, the last thing I'll say on this is um, there have been a lot of people in the news who have used, uh, I, I get the nuclear weapons terminology is pretty complicated and, and arcane and definitions seem irrelevant, but people say things like, uh, deterrence has failed, NATO's deterrent has failed, and that's why Russia has invaded Ukraine. No, deterrence has worked. Ukraine's not in NATO, right? Ukraine's problem is that they are not covered by the deterrent of NATO, which is a whole other debate we could have, but Putin is not striking Western convoys in Poland or Romania that are supplying Western Ukraine, because deterrence, it works right now. Uh, and so that's where I think we would be in really bad territory. And I, uh, I hope we're never there. Thanks for the presentation. Real quickly, taking us back to the 70s and the 80s, your talk was about ground deployed missile systems. But there is technology there at that time. And if any of your research can you speak to, they can deliver using aircraft delivery. Why are you, you hadn't mentioned that or that tell you you can aircraft can take off from bases in these places and deliver a payload um, or missiles or bombs? Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, so this is a great question and, and it speaks to this uh, this idea I keep coming back to about how reassurance is fuzzy. So before 1979, uh, between 1963 and 1979, the alliance for these theater capabilities had almost entirely relied on what they referred to as offshore weapons. This just, this just meant systems that were not based in Europe explicitly. So they were air-launched uh, aircraft or, uh, or sea-launched from submarines and things like this. By 1979, 
they conclude that that's not enough reassurance and that to solve a political problem within NATO, building up confidence that extended deterrence will work, they need to station those missiles on the ground because only with the missiles in and amongst the Europeans would the Europeans feel confident that they were actually going to be used. Okay, well, here's one of the great ironies. Then immediately they decide that this is what they're going to do, and then immediately everybody goes, but I don't want to live alongside a missile. That's terrifying. Can't we put it on a submarine? Because then it's not next to my house, and the Soviets won't target my house. And so this is, this is why I come back to repeatedly that reassurance is fuzzy, right? What reassures one constituency can terrify another one. And so the biggest problem that NATO faces in the early 1980s is that these debates that had been playing out primarily in expert circles amongst specialists who are thinking way too much about nuclear war suddenly become public debate. And when you start to pull at the underlying assumptions of NATO's Cold War strategy, there's not a lot to like there. I mean, saying the best way to keep you safe is that we're going to tell the Soviets that if they do anything, the world is gone. Like, understandably, some people come to the conclusion that, oh my goodness, that means the world is going to be gone. And so it's not any more reassurance. And so there's th these great episodes where after the West Germans having gone all in about the need for, to shore up flexible response, to meet the, this new threat from the Soviet Union, even after they've made this decision, Helmut Schmidt and, uh, and Hans Dietrich Genscher are coming back and every once in a while they're like, but could we do submarine launch systems instead? Because like, that would just be easier with my voters. And so there is this weird, this weird paradox, and, and you can see, right, that what happens uh, as a function of arms control, but also just what is politically palatable in the wake of the Cold War, is that they remove those ground-based systems. And so we go back to relying on air-launched uh, and sea-launch capabilities. You know what? Go ahead. Can we, are you going to yeah. after Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody else can go, and I can, I, that's fine. Hi, thank you again for the uh, presentation. Um, in, um, I guess to kind of wrap up the Q&A session is looking forward into, we've discussed traditional and nuclear warfare, um, but there's now this new domain of cyber warfare. And my question is just simply, how does this new cyber domain augment um, what you've what what you've discussed and what, and how NATO, if that is a factor at all in the potential um, incursion into a nuclear conflict. Yeah, I think that this is one of the places uh, where there is a lot of it really interesting work happening. But it's it's a huge puzzle because it's both an old problem and a new problem. So the capabilities and technology are leaps and bounds of advances, but some of the basic questions about what exactly constitutes an attack on a NATO member, those are old questions. And so here you think about uh, how Article 5, the collective security guarantee at the heart of the North Atlantic Treaty might be invoked. Well, what if, say, uh, China or Russia launch, launches a cyber attack against one of NATO's members? Is that considered dangerous enough, a big enough threat that they invoke Article 5? And if so, how do they respond? Do you respond like for like? So does NATO need to develop cyber capabilities to retaliate? Or do you respond asymmetrically using uh, other sources uh, or tools in the, the, in the toolkit uh, to respond? And, and this is a question uh, that NATO is really in the process of resolving right now. Uh, so that's been, so standing up new cyber commands, investing uh, in research and development, but also on the policy side of just thinking about, thinking through those questions. But what's remarkable for a historian of nuclear deterrence is how much all of the concepts about deterrence from the nuclear and conventional space from the Cold War have just been wholesale imported into the cyber literature, uh, which is really interesting because the threat is so different uh, in so many ways, and so I'm curious to see. This is this is the nerd in me, but I, I'm very curious to see how those on the policy side and the academic side how those debates develop in the next 10 years or so, because I think we're in for dramatic uh, and rapid transformations. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I'm actually. <laughs> <laughs>
So I lied. One more question. Uh, brief answer, because it'll be a brief question. I'm a historian, you know that's hard. I know. <laughs> has there ever been a period where NATO has not been in crisis? No. Uh, uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> but can, not all crises are created equal. But it's always a mess. <laughs> Thank you again. And, you know, may I, <clears throat> uh, may I please remind you that there are books for sale out front, and we're actually going to do the signing down in here. It's a really good book. I've read it, I recommend it. Pick it up. <laughs>